Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself, Mark Vernon, and Rupert Sheldrake. Hello, Rupert. Hello, Mark. So today I wondered if we might pick up on a theme that we were actually talking about in a group just a little before we meet now, which is the notion of objectivity. Um, clearly, it's a huge concern as well as sort of goal in the modern world. Um, objectivity is trusted much more than subjectivity, as if by removing ourselves from the study of things, those things might show up in their truest forms and so um, become the basis for, for knowledge and so on. So it seems like a good one to tease out. Um, do we know what we mean even when we're talking about objectivity? Yes, well, this the talk we had from Richard Gunton about this in Oxford is was I thought quite stimulating, and what he, um, he pointed out rightly is that one of the definitions of objectivity is repeatability. It's something that can be just repeated, and one of the things about science is that it's often said science is uniquely objective because it's repeatable, um, as opposed to subjective aesthetic judgments or something like that. Um, however, as he pointed out, the replication crisis in science um, has actually shown us that, as a matter of fact, most scientific papers in top peer-reviewed journals are actually not repeatable. Um, you know, this is only became apparent around 2015. I mean, some people have suspected it for years, including me, but the um, actual quantitative studies where people have actually tried replicating top papers in biomedicine in psychology and social science and chemistry in a whole range of topics have shown it's actually not replicable so this supposed pillar of scientific objectivity is, is crumbling at the moment and that one of the things that Richard pointed out was that this means we need to think more about what we actually mean by objectivity. I think in the 17th century, at the beginning of modern mechanistic science, um, what Galileo and his uh, colleagues thought of as objectivity was stripping out what they called secondary qualities like color, taste, smell, um, aesthetic appreciation, etc., and dealing only with primary qualities which is mass, momentum, velocity. Uh, in other words, measurable physical features of objects, um, which they then thought were objective and that, uh, that everything else about human perception and experience was subjective. Um, and so they tried to create a science based on those principles. Um, and actually in the 19th century, this was taken a lot further as science became professionalized first in Germany and later in England um, then professional scientists began to pretend that their way of not knowing was entirely superior to that of everyone else before them um, because precisely it was objective and that's when they started adopting this third person style of writing in German it's slightly different they say man uh, you know one has done this but in English it, it took the form of a test tube was taken it was carefully observed uh, it is considered that these results show etc I mean this ridiculous um, passive voice construction which became standard in scientific reports uh, from the late 19th century onwards probably reached its peak around the 1950s and 60s. Um, there's been a backlash against it within the sciences. Um, and uh, I conducted surveys in secondary schools um, over the last 20 years, showing that actually in many secondary schools, teachers are still forcing students to write science reports in the passive voice because they think that's the way science is meant to be because it's objective. And this leads to this view of um, what is sometimes called a view from nowhere, you know, uh, as if nature just unfolds in front of the observing scientists without them actually doing anything, and they just report what's there. Whereas, in fact, of course, scientific experiments are an active process done by people 
who have motives, uh, who are trying to find out answers to questions, um, who've got grant applications to think of, who need to publish results in journals, who might have colleagues who are rivals, who they want to get ahead of, all sorts of human motives come into play. But in the typical scientific paper, all these are completely removed until what's left is this travesty of what's actually happening, a pretense at objectivity, which has now come a terrible cropper with the re reproducibility or replicability crisis. So I yeah. think this is an inherent thing in science. There's been this pretense for a very long time, and it was actually built in by Galileo and people right from the beginning of modern science. Yes, I remember at school, um, which was actually after the 1950s, um, we one of the things which we learned was how to write in this passive voice. Um, it was one of the things you got marked on. Um, but what um, Richard Gunton was suggesting was that um, there's a kind of notion of objectivity which might still be useful. Um, and he was thinking about it in terms of how we represent things. And so when we want to study something, it's quite often useful to focus on what is the key aspect of this thing that we want to study. And so we make a representation of it. And indeed, you know, in the arts, they do the same as well. An artist will produce a picture or um, even a, a musician will um, focus on the kind of harmony, the kind of sounds um, that they seek. And so a world of representations around us can be useful um, and not just in terms of studying, actually, but in terms of opening the world up to us, it, as it were, enables our attention to go in one particular direction and so develop what is seen, what's perceived. Um, but what I really liked about this notion of objectivity as representation is that it doesn't split the objective from the subjective. Um, that what we bring to our attention matters quite as much as what we're attending to. And so it felt a much richer notion of actually, as, as you're suggesting as well there, with this critique of the passive voice, is what's going on anyway in science, um, that uh, the person doing the science is part of the science quite as much as what's being scrutinized. Yes, the, the classification of um, these objective representations is quite interesting. I mean, one, um, what he was arguing is that these are projections and that they're projections that are inherently reductive. We're reducing the complexity of something, something less complex. So one, the most basic kind of projection is, is numerical or, or mathematical. You know, how many apples are there in the bowl sort of thing. Um, the All the complexity of the apples, the developmental form, the differences between the apples, is reduced to a number five, um, and um, and then what's the dimension of the apples? You know, sort of seven centimeters or seven point three centimeters on average, or something like that. Um, that that this projects down. It removes. It's actually what Galileo was doing, removing all what Galileo called secondary qualities, um, and projecting uh, just one particular framework of looking at what's there. Then he showed there's another way of representing another projection, which is where we project down from three dimensions to two, where we make drawings, diagrams, or two-dimensional patterns or forms. Um, and then if we want to represent change or movement, then uh, all the complexities of change are reduced down to kinematic representations, um, which could be in the form of an animated video, for example. Um, that these um, are removing many of the ele elements of our experience and projecting out just simplified, uh, as, as it were, lower dimensional uh, versions. Um, and I suppose one advantage of that, which he points out, is that once you've got those, then you can they can be critiqued by other people and you can have a kind of he didn't use the word intersubjective, but you can have an agreement or you can have criticism. So if I say there are five apples in the bowl, 
um, and you count them, you find there are six, then we can then count them together and find one of us is right and the other's wrong. And we can correct the information. We can make it more inclusive and more people would agree on, on what there is there. So in, in a sense, it, it focused attention implicitly on agreement between people. Um, and uh, by reducing down through these projections, simplifications, uh, it's easier to agree. If we have to say whether we like the taste of an apple, for example, then we're not going to agree necessarily. Um, I may prefer a, a Worcester pear main, and you may prefer a golden delicious. And I don't suppose you do, but uh, you might. Um, um, there then, that's, that's a, a different thing from agreeing that there's a unit apple there and it weighs so much. And it, it, so in a way, it's simplification. And obviously, for many things, it works, because in many ways, mechanistic science is very successful. We've got rockets and jet planes and iPhones and so forth. Um, it's very successful, um, but it has to leave a great deal out. And what, what I liked too was it's it's it, it's using reduction in order to you know serve various purposes, but without falling into reductionism, um, because you know we might look at the same bowl of apples. Um, I say five, you say six, um, but my point of view might be obscuring my vision. So I only see five than six. And so therefore I can consider my role in my error. Um, and so, you know, open up my, perspe my perspective to see um, the fuller picture which you see. And, you know, that's just an example of how um, <coughs> the subjective does play a role even in the reducing to something that can then be shared in a public space. Um, and I, I really like this because Owen Barfield, um, this philosopher, philologist who's so influential on me, um, one of the things which he tracked was when um, the subjective became eclipsed by the objective. And um, you partly outlined that with the history of science um, in the Renaissance and then in the 19th century. Um, but Barfield was also um, very interested in how um, prior to that, that which is subjective was actually thought to be crucial to understanding the, the heart of things. And because in a way, when you, as a, as a scientist or an artist, any kind of contemplative activity, when you make contact with the world, the nature of your contact, who you are and what you bring really matters because it may or may not connect with that which is the heart of the thing you're studying. Um, you know, the mere appearance, the primary qualities may not actually tell you um, everything you need to know, maybe even not the most important things that you need to know about what you're studying. And so earlier writers like Aristotle um, suggested that to know something in its fullest truth, you have to ask yourself, you know, who am I as an observer and what am I bringing to, to my study? Quite as much as just, as it were, abstracting yourself um, for purposes of utility, um, not because reductionism is going to tell you um, the sort of ontological deepest truth about something. And so, you know, who one is um, as a scientist, as an artist, as a discursant, as a philosopher, um, subjective really matters because then you can know whether you're not just perceiving, but maybe resonating, harmonizing, um, you know, really open to all that the world might be bringing to you. Yes, the original meaning of subject wasn't just subjective in our modern sense, but the uh, the the system as it is in itself, including its inner life if it has one, and within panpsychism. Um, we we could say that many forms of self-organizing system have a kind of inner life, inner being as well. Um, and all of this is reduced by this objective method. But I suppose one difference that this new approach is giving us is that for Galileo and the founders of mechanistic science, secondary qualities were assumed to be inside heads or inside brains. 
and not out there in the world at all. The objective world was considered to consist of atoms and particles and things with mass and velocity and so forth, all these physical properties, and later electric charge, temperature, etc. Um, and everything else was supposed to be inside human heads. Um, but there's that that obviously truncated the world. It made the whole world a kind of world of two-dimensional, three-dimensional mechanistic interactions with nothing else going on. But obviously, there's a great deal else going on in the world. I mean, when flowers have scent and perfume and stuff, uh, and, uh, and they attract bees or other pollinators, it, it's not just about what's inside human heads. It's about the way nature works. Flowers were attracting bees 100 million years before humans evolved. So um, the, uh, there are, the role of these qualities, like color and scent and so forth, is not just in human brains. And um, we can still count flowers and we can say a rose typically has five petals and so forth. Um, but uh, by realizing this is a reductive projection, uh, it's not claiming that the rose is nothing but five petals made of little bits of matter interacting physically. Um, it's just saying that's one way we can look at it, and it's a convenient way for the sake of, of science. I mean, that that you're men men mentioning there and um, the inner life of things, not just our own inner life and the return of secondary qualities. And um, that reminds me of things that other scientists at this gathering and were saying, and when Richard was presenting this idea of objectivity, which was the role of aesthetics, and how, when again a scientist, but also you know other people engaging with the world, they use qualities <coughs> like beauty, fit, um, pattern, in order to guide um, their engagement with with the world, and so that sense of one's inner life meeting innate qualities these secondary qualities within the world around one you know feels like it's actually really important for science and um, because things like beauty and pattern um, are real guides towards what's regarded as uh, a reveal a revelation of what you're studying I mean one of the scientists at the meeting was even talking about seemingly um, very abstract things like proteins folding in cells but how proteins folding in themselves have a kind of vitality, have a kind of life um, that you get to know as the scientist. Um, it, it, it wasn't personalizing the protein, but there was certainly a sense of a kind of mutual exchange or communication that the scientist must learn to understand and read. Um, and guides like beauty, um, as well as the habits say of a protein molecule um it's in a life are really important in science it's it's not just a kind of optional extra but actually is the bread and butter the daily life of the scientist yes i think the um you know the kind of field work that bruno latour did scientists and labs how they actually interact so different from the idealized model of the scientist objectively and dispassionately trust you know collecting facts testing hypotheses with no emotional involvement etc um could actually be extended to a, a kind of interview study of scientists about how they actually think about the cells or the tissues or the organisms or the subatomic particles they're interacting with i suspect some of them would personalize them and some of them might feel they're getting to know them on a personal kind of way. Um, all of this, of course, is washed out um, and bleached out in this whole process of writing scientific papers. But I've never actually seen a study of how scientists think of them, the systems they work on and how they, you know, do they dream about them? I mean, we know from a few famous examples like Kekulé and the benzene ring, that scientists do dream and dream about problems they're confronting in their work. But I think it would be a very interesting study to look at just an interview study of scientists in different fields 
and to how they feel about the systems they're working with. Actually, um, I, it's, it, in a way, I'm I'm aware of one such um, paper that's been written. Um, it, it, it's by the cognitive scientist John Viveki, and he, with colleagues, um, studied the way that the scientists operating the rover that was sent to Mars, how they relate to the rover on Mars, and found that their imaginative engagement with the rover was quite as important as the measurements and calculations that are necessary as well. You know, so much so that they would pretend to be the rover to work out what might be a good move for it to make. Um, and so that um, deep imaginative involvement, which John Vaveke would, would put down to how we need um, what he calls relevance realization, um, you know, amidst the mass of data that would come to one, even in a relatively simple scenario, picking out the data that's significant and important um, is really, really hard. You get a combination explosion, as it's sometimes put, even with relatively small amounts of data. And so this relevance re realization is really important. And at least the way that we humans do it is by using our imaginations, entering empathically into that which we're engaging with. And that tells us how we might make the next move, what might be successful, what might be a failure. Yeah, so he actually, you know, talked to, watched, I think, um, the scientists engaging with the Mars rover, and um, I believe even sort of saw them crawling around on the ground and so on, um, really, and personalizing the rover, and um, it became a kind of character to them. So, you know, it was really fascinating. I, I think that has been, is beginning to be done, partly as um, the whole notion of what it takes to have cognition opens up, and itself um, ceases to be a rather reductive undertaking, largely because of the failures of artificial intelligence, um, that it's realised that there's a lot more going on in the conscious mind um, than pure manipulation of, of data. But it reminded me too, Rupert, of a comment you made, and I wonder whether this links as well. You, you um, made the observation that a recent study in Nature had suggested that um, innovation in science is really flattening or even falling off, even as more and more money is put into science. Um, and I just wonder whether it's because science has become such a reductive method um, that, uh, that, that that's happening. And so, you know, reductionism almost, you might say, is sort of turned around um, to, um, to bite science itself. Yes, well, the, the study in nature uh, is um, one that looks at innovation and disruptive research within science. And many people have noticed over decades now that the rate of innovation in science is slowing down. There's fewer and fewer real breakthroughs. Yet more and more people are working within the sciences and the expenditure on science is increasing everywhere. Um, so there's a very strong law of diminishing return at work. Um, and one of the things that the authors of this study in Nature did was looked at the references. It was a, it analyzed huge quantities of data using computers, using published papers and bibliographical methods, um, bibliometric methods. And one of the things they looked at is within a particular field of science, say protein chemistry, um, would a paper in that field be quoted in, say, botany or physiology or something else, other fields of inquiry? Or would it only be quoted by other protein chemists? And they found that in, in, in until about 30 or 40 years ago, there was quite a lot of cross-quotation of papers that science was networked across subjects. It's now got more and more narrowed down so that people are only quoting things in their own field, probably because they're only reading things in their own field. There's so much research going on, you can't read everything. And to get ahead in your own field, you have to publish lots of papers and get them cited by other people in the field. Um, and so the, the, the pressures are on, so they're just narrowing down the attention of scientists to narrow and narrower fields of interest with less chance to cross-pollinate with less chance to think about ideas that aren't just already there within the field. 
So science is now set up in such a way that it's designed to develop, to deliver small incremental improvements to knowledge along established lines. Whereas anything that's disruptive, that really does lead to new breakthroughs, new discoveries, new, that potentially new technologies and so on, is actually not favored by the system, in fact, frozen out by it, in fact. Um, so I think that the moving back from this false and discredited view of objectivity, discredited because the replication crisis objectively discredits it, as it were, um, the, the, to this view of, of, of objectivity as useful projections in some circumstances, but always a simplification, always a, um, a reduction, um, uh, is is much more helpful. And um, if in scientific education people were in, empowered to use their imaginations, encouraged to use their imaginations, uh, encouraged to pay attention to their dreams or to um, ways of seeing how things could be connected in new ways, um, it might lead to a great deal more creativity. Of course, it may not be good for their career because if you if you do new things that other people aren't doing, um, then you're not going to get grants from established fields of science or papers in the top journals in established fields of science. Um, but something has to be done if we want the sciences to go on being productive and creative, because right now, literally hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent every year on scientific research. And most of the papers published are not even cited once. Um, so the point is, most of it is a complete waste of time. And many scientists are devoting their whole careers to pursuing uh, scientific success in terms of numbers of papers in journals, which affects the way they get grants. But in terms of the understanding of nature or the betterment of human life, it's really a waste of time. And the awful thing is it's not even much fun for those doing it because uh, the 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 methods of the pretend objectivity, etc., the the attempt to expunge all personal elements from at least the public report, um, means that science is a fairly joyless activity for a lot of scientists who are working really hard um, on very narrow problems. Um, so there's a lot wrong with the way it is at the moment. And, and I think thinking about objectivity may indeed help to free things up. Yeah, I mean, maybe because of the sense of even despair, um, maybe, a, a, you know, scientists will begin to think, can we do it in other ways? Um, you know, sheer quantity, again, another kind of reduction um, is not really serving us well. And then, of course, as you were talking there, I was rem remembering Merlin, your son's book, Entangled Life, um, where, of course, he very deliberately brings in all sorts of experiences and weaves it into the discovery of more and more about this world of fungi. Um, so, you know, that's done hugely well. It's been recognised by the Royal Society. Um, so perhaps there is a mood abroad, actually, to, to weave again once more this notion of the subjective and the objective and of course it's not just good for science but it's good for we human beings because the world um, can officially be re-enchanted again as well can come back to life and, and that, mm. that, that's good for all sorts of reasons very good well no, thanks very much um i hope that was worth teasing out um for for our listeners um and that they've had thoughts um and maybe even will have conversations amongst themselves as well. Um, but it was certainly good to, to hear Richard Gunton's work and to explore it again now. So thank you. Thank you, Mark.